when I was asked to, uh, to present, um, they kind of said, well, what do you want to talk about? And I said, well, IT security. And they said, well, well what does IT security mean? And I said, well, that's a very good question. I mean, IT security is huge. And uh, so I thought about it. And, and as fate happens, there was something kind of funny that happened uh, on the way to the conference. I was going through customs, and yeah, I'm Canadian, eh? Um, but so yeah, so I was going through customs, and when they asked me for my ID, I stopped and I said, well, why? I mean, I saw the cameras. I know you're using facial rec, so you've, you've already, you already knew who I was before I even got into line. With facial rec, you called up my Homeland Security pro, uh, file. So you already know my family, my friends, where I live, my security clearances my border crossings for the last little while. Uh, you know all of that information. And then with my travel reservation, you already know where I'm coming from, where I'm going. You know whether I'm a, a security risk or not. So again, I ask you, uh, well, why do you need to see my ID? And much to my surprise, they didn't like that response very much. And so they invited me <laughs> to have a much longer in-depth conversation about it in a private room. Um, but, but that said, I, I made it through. And uh, that story kind of is a lighthearted way of, uh, of kind of summarizing the issues and the dilemmas facing organizations today. Right? So, but before we get into some of the solutions, let me look at uh, the issue of the problem a little bit more. So digital transformation, what does it mean? And like a lot of things, digital transformation is going to mean different things to different people. So for the gray hairs in the room like me, you may understand or you may remember terms like process re-engineering, business transformation, workflow automation. Others may, uh, may uh, resonate or relate to different terms like data-centric design, user-centric uh, design, uh, data lakes, social media. And, but regardless of whether you're looking at a paperless office or if it's uh, a little bit more modern, like a scene out of the Minority Report, where you've got interactive displays and screens that are, prevent that are presenting customized and personalized content as, as you walk up. There's no denying the fact on the volume of data that's available today and the, 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 the huge desire that organizations are looking uh, to try or are trying to gain a, a competitive advantage by analyzing that data. And if, if that's not enough, let's take a look at 2018 and what an Internet Minute has to, has to offer. So in one minute on the Internet around the world in 2018, there were 18 million texts. I'm pretty sure half of them came from my kids. There were 187 million emails. There were 3.7 million Google searches. 973,000 Facebook logins. Over 266,000 hours of content were viewed on Netflix. And over $863,000 spent on online shopping. And all of this is just in one minute. So for those of you keeping score at home, that works out to 1.24, over $1.24 billion spent online each and every day. And in this quest for the almighty dollar, Organizations are looking for an edge. And that edge, edge is insight on what, is, is, what, is going, what it is or what, will take, what it will take to separate you from your money. And the key to that insight is data. So a lot of these services that, uh, that you subscribe to and you work with on a daily basis, a lot of these uh, services are free. I mean, all you need to do is input a little bit of information, a little bit of data, and you've got access to that service. But I'll pose, put this to you. If the service is free, then really you are the product. And if you think about that for a moment, you're willing to give away all kinds of information. I think everybody's probably here um, from out of town. You're probably staying at a hotel. Think about this. How many people have, via, have posted about the meal they had last night or the meal this morning or the view from their room or posted something about the conference? All of this information and all of this data is, can be used to identify who you are and, uh, and, and where you are and what you're all about.
And I mean, it, it's, it, it's a little bit foreign to me, but so many people are willing to give away their most intimate information online for free, right? They're talking about their friends online, they're talking about their family, their likes, their dislikes, their opinions, their swipes, both left and right. I've even heard about a new service that uh, is matching pets to uh, pets that need a home. And you can swipe left or right on the dog and, or the cat. <laughs> so all of this information is being posted and you're giving it away freely. So with that in mind, you can start to think about from a security standpoint how difficult that is. Right? If you're willing to give all this, away, all this information away for free, well then how can you protect what's really important? So if we shift from some of these online social uh, feeds to something that might be a little bit more near and dear. So let's say, let's pick a bank account uh, for, uh, for an ex example. You're working with a bank, you may want to take out a loan, you may want to set up a new account. What sort of information are they, do they have to give you? Or do you have to give them to, uh, to, to get it started? Well, you're going to need your date of birth, you're going to need your address, you're going to need some of your employment history, your family situation. And so if we shift over for a second, we look a little bit closer. If you look at that list, and then you think about some of the information that you may post kind of online freely, just so the people will know who they were, to so build that element of trust in order to work uh, to achieve uh, what it is that your company is paying you to do. You notice, I challenge you to tell me the difference between, let's say, the questions that uh, your financial institution is asking you to set up your account or the information that, uh, that you're freely posting for your online profile. And I just put this up just to illustrate or to highlight that the line is being blurred between what's public domain and what's private. And if that line is so blurred, well then it kind of highlights the challenge that, uh, that organizations face today when it comes to information security. Because if you think about it, on one hand, we're giving all of this information away. On the other hand, when a breach happens, we're very quick to vilify those organizations that failed to keep their, that information safe. Right? And if you think about it, there's all of the, 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 the big names, right? Everything from Yahoo to Equifax to Walmart to, I mean, the list goes on. And they, they cut, have all this information and all of a sudden it's out in the open for the bad guys to use against us. But then when you think about it, half of that information you're posting online for for the world to see. So it kind of highlights why security today is so important. So where did we come from? And I think Donovan uh, kind of teamed it up well. He, he kind of set the stage. He goes, there was a way that, 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 uh, that, in this case, Microsoft was doing things in software development, and they've been forced to change. If you look at organizations today, there's a traditional uh, bricks and mortar type organization, and security was done in a certain way. In, the, in a traditional environment, you've got your building, your IT closet uh, is in that room, your network is in that room. If you want to get access to, to your company resources, well, you showed up to the, work, uh, to, to the office in the morning, you logged in, you, when you're done, you logged out, and away you left, and everything stayed inside that, that building. But the world is changing. So now we're in a day and age where Uber is the largest taxi provider and they don't own a single car, right? Today, Airbnb is the largest hotelier, and they don't own a single property. So every, organizations and companies are changing. So in this world where everybody's connected all the time, how does security change in order to keep pace, right? So what's the lowest common denominator? Well, information or data is the lowest common denominator, whether it's on-prem, whether it's in the data center, whether it's in the cloud, the crown jewels for any organization now is information or data. And so it behooves the organizations to protect that data wherever it exists or wherever it lives. So, 
I happened in on a conversation not too long ago. It was pretty cool. So the chief information security officer ran up to the CEO and he was so excited. He goes, hey, my team's been working hard on this for a long time and, I, and I'm very happy to report that we've narrowed down the threats facing our organization to two groups. CEO is ecstatic. He says, great, only two groups? That's awesome. Tell me more. Well, we've narrowed the threats down to those that work for us and those who don't. <laughs> At which point the conversation took a dramatic change, but, uh, but that's a different story. So when you think about it and you hear about a hack or a breach in the news today, it usually immediately comes to mind an image of a, of a hacker, right? I'm not sure what's, what it is with the hoodies, but apparently hoodies are the thing, right? And you've got that image. And it's probably accentuated with Holly, by Hollywood. Right? And you, you think about some individual working alone and probably in their mother's basement at all hours of the night, t talking, uh, typing away, trying to hack through a firewall or hack through an organization's uh, IT defenses. But when you look at the numbers and you do the analysis and you roll back the covers, really the larger threat is human nature. Because at the end of the day, <laughs> The chair to keyboard interface is only human. And accidents happen, right? And so when accidents happen, do you have the tools, the policies, the processes in place in order to help minimize uh, that risk? I like stories. So here's another story. Yeah, this one's actually true, actually. So it just makes it even better. The, um, I was uh, at an auto parts store with, uh, with a buddy of mine. And uh, we were going through, and I'm not sure how the conversation came around to it, but I finally bet him. I said, hey, I bet I can get your phone number from the cashier. And he goes, really? Well, what do you want to bet? And I said, well, let's keep it simple, because I know it's easy. So uh, how about a pint? All right, sure, no problem. And so we go through, we finish shopping for whatever it is we wanted to shop for. I go first, I'm up in the cash register, and a lovely, little, a lovely girl said, uh, how, how was your uh, experience? Did you find everything you needed? Yes, yes, everything's fine. Can I get your phone number? Well, <clears throat> I had to, yeah, at first it made me smile, but uh, and then, then I thought about it, and I said, yeah, sure. But actually, before I give you my, my number, I'm pretty sure that I'm, my file's already set up. How about I tell you my name, you can call up the file, you, the, you tell me what number you've got on file and I'll tell you if it's current. And she goes, well, sure, all right. And I said, so John Snow, all right. She types it up and he says, yeah, we've got, uh, we've got you here on file. The number is 555. <laughs> and at that point I turned to my buddy and I just smiled. It was that easy. And there's an awful lot that, that's wrong about that, that situation, right? First off, why is the cashier giving, volunteering information without actually validating who I am? But what's even more strange is, what is an auto parts store doing with my phone number? What do they need it for? I mean, is it a life and death uh, situation for a recall if the screwdriver I bought is faulty? So, and I find this over and over and over again. Organizations are quick to collect information and collect data, but they don't have an immediate need for it. So why are they collecting it in the first place? Because once you collect it, well then you're on the hook to protect it, right? And that's just one example. So if we look into this a little bit more, and you look at what's behind a lot of the breaches, when information gets out when it shouldn't, well over three quarters of it is accidental. I think everybody here is in the room, or in the room has had that occurrence where they're either sending a text, and as soon as they click send, they realize it went to the wrong conversation, the wrong list in their history, or they've done that email, and then auto-populate picks the wrong bill and then they click send and it's oops, hopefully it wasn't important. All of those are accidental disclosures, right? And you can't get away from eliminating all of them, but with the right policies, procedures, and tools in place, you can definitely mitigate it. I've got another story here about an organization. Uh, they were taking part in a large IPO and uh, so it's an um, uh, investment banker. It was going to be huge for this organization. All of a sudden, with the wrong auto-populate, information about that, that release got sent to the wrong party. It was premature disclosure. That organization was prevented from participating. Cost them tens of millions of dollars. So accidental disclosures are real, and, but they can be prevented. 
Um, another story kind of around this, around how being helpful is actually potentially a risk. There's a large city uh, back in Canada. Their website was taken over, was kind of hijacked uh, a couple years back. And the story behind that hijacking is, is fascinating. The entire city website was taken over and not a single finger to keyboard was used. The person called into the IT help desk. They had the name of an actual employee that worked in the, uh, in the IT group and they had the first name of his manager. And with that, they had a 15 to 20 minute conversation with the help desk and they just pleaded their case. I'm sick, I'm working from home, I have to do this deadline, my password just changed, I can't remember what it is, can you help? And so then they talked about it and they said, well, who are you? Here, this is my name. Uh, all right, well, what are the challenge questions? Uh, they started asking the challenge questions. What street did you, did, uh, um, did you grow up on? And the guy was struggling and he was feeding them along. And then all of a sudden, the help desk person became very helpful and asked them leading questions to the point where they was able to get through the challenge questions. And so once they validated who this caller was and that they, they had the right to know, then they kept on going, right? They said, well, you know, we're doing this move. I have to change the, uh, the website. Uh, the, I have to change the, the DNS address of the website. Rather than me log in and do it, since you're there, we, would you mind changing the DNS address? Well, sure, why not? We've gone this far. <laughs> and so, yeah, can you please change it to, 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 to this new address? A couple keystrokes later, the help desk uh, successfully reassigned the DNS address for the city website, and then the rest is history. And that's human nature. People are designed, they're pre for the most part, they're, they're programmed to be helpful. But in their desire to be helpful, they often uh, can put information se uh, security or data at risk. So. Now looking at switching over in a little bit and starting to look at the technology and some of the things that you can do behind the scenes, but where to start? I'll try to put technology into a frame of reference that might be a little bit easier to understand. I think during the intro, they covered off a huge amount of, uh, of security, right? All kinds of different topics. But if I kind of summarize it and break it down, I think probably some of you are familiar with the five W's, the who, what, where, when, why, and how. So the five W's and a friend. Um, so I'll try to put uh, technology into that frame of reference for you. So if we start with identity and access management, the who and the what, what is this? So identity, who are you? And, do you, and are you who you say you are? And do you have a right to, to, be asking, uh, to, to be asking entrance into the system? And then the access is the what. What are you authorized to see? And this is really the foundation for any sort of security profile or security posture. And, it's, and, and without it, you're really putting your entire security posture at risk. It doesn't matter where that information or where that data lives, whether it's an on-prem solution, whether it's a hosted solution, whether it's a cloud solution. Um, it, the key thing is, is, uh, is uh, articulating and identifying who that person is that's coming in. So the, the cornerstone there is what? Well, it's a username and password. So password policy is important. You see a lot of breaches and when uh, passwords are involved, there's always a quick analysis of all of the information that was just disclosed. And it still blows me away how password and password one, two, three are two of the top three uh, passwords that are being used in, in that breach, right? So in my mind, the only time you should ever use password as your password is if you spell it out. I use password as my password. <laughs> spell it out. Because statistically speaking, a 14 character simple password is harder to crack than an eight character complex password. So make it long, make it complex, make it drawn out. The other aspect on, uh, um, on the identity piece, who are you, is put a second factor uh, authentication in there. Right? Multi-factor authentication is the single largest uh, stumbling block that, uh, that face uh, um, attackers. Or, to put it another way, it's the easiest thing that you can do to add that extra layer of security to prevent um, inadvertent access or unlawful, unlawful access. Right? So the pen test teams and the VA teams that, that, that we lead 
the practitioners routinely come back to me and they say the single largest thing that, st that uh, stymies them when they try to do uh, uh, a review or when they try to break into a system is second factor authentication, something you physically have. So whether it's a mobile code, that uh, one-time password that comes to your phone, whether it's the little dongle that, uh, that changes every 15, 20 seconds, right? that second factor makes it uh, very uh, hard, much harder to, uh, or much more secure. And then the authorization piece, the right to know, the need to know. Just because you'd like to have access to certain information doesn't necessarily mean you should have access to that information. So the whole concept of least privilege access is important, right? So does somebody need to have admin rights to their phone or admin, admin rights to their laptop? If you limit that, to, if you limit access to only those that actually need that information to do their job, you're making your environment more secure. And with this rush to the cloud, I'm finding that a lot of organizations are kind of skipping this step, right? They make the assumption that the cloud environment that they're moving to is secure. Right? And there it is. The infrastructure is secure. But it doesn't matter what provider of that hosted service is or who they are, they are not responsible for the data and the information that you put there. That ends up being your responsibility. So whether it's a CASB solution, a cloud access security broker, whether it's an information, an IAM solution, protecting that information and protecting that data is your responsibility. All right, so that's the who, the what, the where. Where is your information? Where is your data? Where is it moving? The whole concept of data loss or data leakage prevention isn't new. This term is uh, the first products came out, I don't know, 10, 12, 14 years ago. And when it came out at that time, uh, they were doing keyword searches. They were bragging, the products of, the, of, of, of that day were, were bragging about how they could go 11 layers deep in attachments. They'll look at, they'll, they'll do the, the word analysis and the keyword search for, in, for attachments inside of attachments inside of attachments, and they were very secure. The issue was they were so secure they were catching all kinds of things that, they should, that, that, that were just normal business, right? So the, the DLP solutions of the time, they'd be turned on and immediately what would happen is, while those, those filters at the perimeter would trigger, it would stop an email from going and it was mission critical or was a regular business email. And uh, the, the person that sent it didn't know that it was blocked for another day or two. There were so many false positives that the business owners uh, complained and they were screaming crying bloody murder to the IT guys, to the security guys and they say, hey, Whatever you're doing, stop, because we can't conduct business this way. So all this money was spent on the solutions, and, the, and next thing you know, they're just sitting there in observation mode because, uh, it, because uh, the way that they were actually implemented were, was failing the organization, which is a key thing, because really, the, it's not a technology problem. You have to start with the people. The people in the organization need to understand the value of the data that they're dealing with and they're handling and touching on a daily basis. Right? They need to know the significance of it. They need to know how to treat it. You need to have the policies and the procedures in place in order to dictate what happens to that information. Right? Nomenclature is huge. Company confidential, company proprietary, what's the difference? If you were to ask anyone in the organization, are they going to come back with the same definition? Do they know how that information needs to be treated? Right? The difference between a customer's address and a customer's credit card, is it the same, is it different? How should I be handling it? Those policies and procedures need to be in place before any sort of technology, uh, technical solution can be uh, even come close to being uh, supportive. And then there's a lot of talk these days around shadow IT, right? So shadow IT, what is that? Well, those are IT systems that are being used to conduct business that aren't sanctioned by the IT group. Well, okay, fine. Why does that happen? Why does that uh, scenario come, come up to exist? Well, the email filters are put at five megabytes per attachment, so if I've got a large file I need to share, how else am I gonna, gonna do it? I'm gonna put it on a USB, I'm gonna carry it around in my pocket, I'm gonna use my personal email, uh, Gmail, I'm gonna use my Google Drive, or I'm gonna use Dropbox, and I'm gonna share that information. 
But now all of a sudden the company IT has lost visibility of that data and is it sensitive, is it not sensitive? If that information all of a sudden gets out, it does it uh, present a risk to the, organ to the company? So it comes back to processes. Do you have the processes in place and the ability to be able to support business? And once you do, then you can put the tools in place to control it and, uh, and restrict where information flows and in what form or how does it flow. What, where, when. So when, when is information accessed, right? When are people accessing the information? And behavioral an analytics is uh, something new, um, relatively new. And really what it is, is, is analyzing information, analyzing data to try to figure out if a certain action was normal or not. And I like to say that, I mean, if you think about it, all of the devices and all the applications that you're running, they're generating logs, they're generating data, they're ge generating records. Data, in my mind, is not the problem, especially IT data. Geez, we've got more IT data than we know what to do with. Actionable IT data is really what the issue is. So how do you find that needle that you need to pay attention to in that huge stack of needles? And this is where technology, in my mind, can really come to, come to help. Is um, whether it's algorithm based, whether it's AI based, using tools to help to automate the mundane tasks of searching through all of the ones and zeros to find the one the, to find that one bit of information that you really need to pay attention to is key. And so, really, what these behavioral analytics tools are doing is they're trying to they, they basically establish a baseline of what's normal, right? what's normal for you, the individual, what's normal for the department. And then when a new act action comes in, it's able to compare that new action to what it believes is normal and make a determination as to whether it's, uh, it's, it's a safe action or whether it's something that, uh, that maybe should be, um, warrants a little bit more attention paid to it. So the story here on this one, there was an organization here in the States, the FBI came knocking on the front door at one point and they said, does this person work for you? Yes. Well, we believe that, uh, that this person's been stealing uh, intellectual property from your company and selling it overseas. Oh, really? Yeah, we need your help in order to build the case and to, to really determine for sure whether or not this is happening. So they put a behavioral analytics tool in place and in really a span of a couple weeks, they had more than enough information to, to determine without a fact or beyond a shadow of a doubt that this person has been accessing intellectual property and, and downloading and, and taking that information uh, out of the company. Not only did they have the, that case built up against that one individual that the FBI was asking about, but they also found the six other people that were working with them that the FBI didn't even know about. So in that, in that, that sort of example is pretty powerful when it's saying, yeah, all right, we're looking at the behavior, they're accessing files, they're ac accessing code and IP that they normally don't have access to or don't have need to do on their daily basis, and they're accessing it at weird hours at, all, at different times of the day. There's also a positive side effect or um, uh, uh, another way that this technology ends up being used. There's another case where regional managers, so the company uh, had uh, regional managers and they rotated every quarter. And so all of a sudden the system all of a sudden flagged every single one of these uh, regional managers for suspicious behavior at the end of the quarter. Close the business, all of a sudden after hours, the last day of the quarter, they all of a sudden downloaded huge amounts of data. That they, they, so it's a different pattern, it's suspicious, kind of looks like maybe they're trying to take the company's secrets and they're gonna uh, um, start working for a competitor the next day. So then when the, when the managers were asked about it, they said, hey, we noticed that you downloaded a huge amount of information. Why is that? And they said, well, every quarter you move us to a new territory. And they go, yeah. Well, all of the information and the files that we need in order to manage the new territory, I don't have access to once I move. So I download everything that, 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 uh, today in order to do my job tomorrow. Oh, well, that makes sense. But it also then highlights a broken process. So the, yes, the tools can be are very powerful to, to flag anomalies, but they need to be reviewed and they need to be analyzed to, to, to figure out whether those anomalies are malicious or whether there is an indication of a broken process. The how or the why. How do, you keep, how do you keep information? How do you keep your crown jewels uh, um, protected? 
I know I've left it to the end, but arguably behind it, uh, identity and access management is probably the most important uh, safeguard that you can put in place. Because at the end of the day, stuff's going to happen. And when that happens, when data leaves the organization, if the bad guys can't read it, you're still protected. And so encryption, without a doubt, is something that needs to be used. And yeah, tongue in cheek, I was listening to one guy speak a little while ago, and they were talking about WannaCry and some of the, the huge global uh, ransomware attacks. He came up with the line at that point, and he goes, yeah, and this was the first time any of these organizations had ever used any, uh, encryption. But of course, that didn't work out the way that the, uh, that wasn't uh, encryption for the purposes of good. Because at the end of the day, stuff is, bad stuff will happen. And I firmly believe that organizations aren't going to be judged by if something happens. They're going to be judged more by how did they respond and did they take the right uh, steps uh, ahead of time in order to try to, uh, to protect that information and protect that data. Right? So they're going to be judged on whether, that inf that whether their response was timely, whether it was sincere, whether it was accurate, whether it was open. Did they communicate um, quickly, efficiently, effectively? Did they cooperate? There's uh, a case uh, a few years ago. If I it, it take, a, take this example outside of the IT space, this is in the food processing space. So Maple Leaf uh, had a, an E. coli outbreak. And so somewhere in one of their processing plants, uh, E. coli was being put in, uh, people got sick. And in the food industry, uh, an incident, incident like that could be a death knell for them, right? It would send people running from the brand forever. But the way that Maple Leaf conducted themselves in the face of that, at that incident actually improved their brand image and improved their customer loyalty because they responded immediately. They didn't wait uh, and until they figured out where the plant was to, to do the recall. As soon as, that, uh, as, soon as they had um, that first instant, uh, instance, they immediately pulled all of their product from the shelves. They immediately went to all of their plants and they took, it, took, them, it took them all apart. They cleaned everything, all aspects of all plants. They kept uh, the public informed what they were doing, what they were doing, why they were doing it. They were able to definitively identify the source and, um, and they were able to uh, uh, respond, I guess, in the eyes of the public in a very professional, consistent, and, uh, and trustworthy manner. So that's an example where the company wasn't uh, judged by the event. They were judged by how they respond to, responded to that event. And in the world of IT security and um, information security, I believe it's, uh, there's a lot of similarities there. So how, was, is the company acting responsible with the information that they're collecting? And when something happens, are they, uh, are, are they sincere and, uh, and, um, and are they responding appropriately? Uh, even GDPR and uh, some of the other privacy legislations, the fines are less around if something happens and more around what, what was a company doing their due diligence ahead of time and did they respond appropriately uh, after the fact. So the final thought, and in a lot of ways it ties into what Donovan was talking about this morning. At the end of the day, it's people, process, and technology in that order, right? It's not technology. Technology is not our problem. We've got more technology than we know what to do with, right? We've got we vendors, there's trade shows all over the place. You've got no, no shortage of, of, uh, of vendor sales reps and sales engineers willing to come up and tell you why their product is so much better than any, any, anything else in the market. Why, if you get this, it's going to be the, the, the cure to everything that ills you. Well, not so much. You have to start with the people. Invest in the people. Do they have the training and the understanding of what they're doing? Do they, under, do they know how to manage and maintain the products? The processes in place and the policies in place. Does everybody know how the organization wants information treated in a certain manner or in different instances? And then once you have that, the people uh, and the processes, then technology can be used to enforce those policies and to make those processes a lot more uh, efficient. So with that, I'm going to thank you very much for your time. 
And if you've got any questions at all, as long as it doesn't have to do with the Ottawa Senators, because they're an embarrassment at the moment, <clears throat> please feel free to ask. Okay, your comment on yep. GDPR. So have you seen a particular client where they should have been fined and because they had shown that they were working on it or they were sorry or whatever that they actually got out of that fine? Very good question. So no, GDPR from an enforcement standpoint is new. Um, the first fine, uh, I believe against uh, either Microsoft or Google for $63 million. Uh, it's a, I think that was the first fine that I've read about. Um, so the, my comment there around uh, is, is more the interpretation of the legislation before, before it came in, in, into act. Right? So companies are responsible for looking after the data and protecting that information. At the end of the day, there's a couple concepts out there, security by design and privacy by design. And, uh, and really what GDPR is trying to do is reinforce uh, those principles, I guess, right? So privacy by design, make sure that the, um, the owner of that information, which is you, uh, knows w what's being collected and where, uh, and, uh, has, and you give your consent, right? And uh, that only that information that is needed uh, to conduct that transaction is being collected. So that's kind of the, the main cornerstone. Um, but the interpretation around the legislation was more about, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on response uh, as well as uh, what uh, the obligations are uh, for maintaining that information in the first place. So no, haven't seen uh, a lot on the fine side yet. Yeah. I had a question about cyber more in the physical sense as opposed to sure. data. Um, kinetics, I know, is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. I'm just wondering whether or not you guys have been doing any work in that space. Kinetics? Yeah, so the whole idea that I, I, executives on the elevator, I take over the elevator and kill them. Okay. Um, short answer is yes. So uh, when, you, when we look at things, um, uh, we do a lot of government work, and there's a term threat risk assessment, which is pretty common on the government side. Uh, industries, um, in my mind, uh, benefit from the same process or process, but uh, uh, they look at it in a different way. Government, it's a checkbox. We have to do a threat risk assessment, whereas industries are more is more interested in the outcome. And um, on that, um, when you do a threat risk assessment, you're looking at all assets: human, physical, uh, virtual. Um, so information, data, IT is, um, and, and one of those scenarios ends up being uh, the threats uh, against individuals. Um, so yes, there are definitely are uh, one tools out there uh, to help identify threats before they happen. Um, there's tools that, uh, that that we've worked with that basically monitor social media. Uh, the wildfires that were happened up in Alberta and the smoke uh, kind of affected the entire northeast or north yeah northwest. Um, th th these tools actually identified um, the the outbreaks. Uh, about a half hour, an hour before 911 was even called. So just because of uh, looking at social media, picking up the threats, picking up the feeds. Um, so th those sorts of kinetic or, or physical threats, there are tools out there um, to help um, identify them ahead of time, it, potentially. But the whole process about uh, identifying and, um, and then quantifying uh, that potential risk um, and then prioritizing it um, is, uh, is kind, of, kind of covered up under the th threat risk analysis. And often leads to policies where executives can't travel in the same plane, to, and that, that sort of thing, right? So it's a matter of identifying the risk, quantifying it, and then uh, comparing it to, uh, to what your threat profile, what your risk profile um, uh, will tolerate. Yeah, and so, but when you IP enable everything, then your cyber risk expands dramatically. Absolutely. So, for example, I was meeting with an airline, and they were talking a lot about how they're going to use biometrics to help you speed up the process of getting on a plane. Well, you think about it, if I show up and I'm a terrorist, and but I look like Rick, and in in terms of the, I take over the biometrics, and I'm and I'm Rick now, I get on the plane safely, but I'm an actual terrorist, so I end up you know taking over the plane. 
Well, so, and that, that technology is, uh, is actually kind of helping and hurting us at the same time. Um, we do some work with uh, organizations in Canada that don't carry business nut cards and introduce themselves by first name only. Um, and the, those folks, uh, I mean, you see Hollywood, you see, uh, you open up a drawer and you got like 18 different passports, all with the same picture and all with different names. That doesn't exist anymore. Um, the little story I talked about at the start was facial rec. Well, that's real. And if you're uh, an asset traveling for the purposes of good or evil, and you've got multiple identities, you're going to be flagged by facial rec before, <laughs> as you walk into an airport. And so all of a sudden, if you're flagged by facial rec, and today I'm traveling under the name Bill, and tomorrow I'm traveling under the name John, well, the systems are going to flag that, and they're going to know that. And so now more and more um, people need to travel under, under, under one name and one, one identity. But yeah, so biometrics uh, is a way of really upping uh, the security posture because it's something that you have. It's something that you are. It's very difficult to fake. Um, so yeah, it becomes key. Um, it, absolutely. Yeah, you say if, yeah. Apologize, I should be using the mic. It's also a major risk point. Just like I, I was meeting with one of the big telecoms and they were talking about they were, you know, they're developing a system to yep. do more voice recognition, but they don't want to own, nobody wants to own the database internally because it's a big threat. Yeah, and um, uh, absolutely. And I think it was, uh, was it the first iPhone that came out with the, uh, with, with the, the thumb pad uh, access? And they realize that, well, the fingerprints that are already on the display, all you have to do is put like a piece of paper and you kind of press down on it and it unlocks the, uh, the phone right away. So anytime technology evolves, there's going to be a, um, a, an affiliated or an associated counterpoint. Um, and, and really, that's why uh, security is ever changing, because technology is ever changing. Um, you know, it's, there's a casino in the States they had this IOT fish tank, right? So this fish tank, and it had sensors in it to, to tell when the water was uh, needed to be cleaned, and, and it was, it, it, is it a healthy environment for the fish? But it was plugged into the same network as, uh, as all of their gaming uh, tools and their high roller table, right? And so all of a sudden, a bad guy comes in and says, oh, well, that's wirelessly connected. All of a sudden, that fish tank became uh, an attack vector uh, for the casino, and they made off with the entire high roller list. So it's, um, and then there's, the stories go on and on. Uh, you got a, an IoT kettle, so that you can click a button on your phone and you can and you can trigger the kettle while, uh, remotely. Well, that's cool, but the password for your home network ends up being hardwired into the kettle, and it never changes. So now all of a sudden, a kettle is no longer a kettle; it's a threat vector. So that, that scenario, you're absolutely right. The, as technology evolves, then the bad guys are trying to figure out, well, how do we get around that? And so it, it, is a, it ends up being a huge cat and mouse. 